here to introduce Mary Lee Davies, a longtime partner of Ferris Von Wills and Murphy, a, a hundred year old firm here in Vancouver. She does labor law, employment, uh, human rights. Um, we'll talk to you a lot about some real pitfalls that you could fall into and if you have a problem, uh, if, you were, if I had a problem, this is the lawyer I would come to see about it in the HR area. And if you have an interest in animals, you can talk to her about that because she's the chair of... Uh, the past president of the BCSPCA, president. president of the Vancouver Humane Society, on the board for Mercy for Animals and some other groups, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so this is my partner James. You can read his his biography. James is a senior partner at Ferris. He's also uh, one of the leading lawyers in Canada in the intellectual property area. Uh, he's practiced at Ferris, I guess, a little bit longer than me. Uh, and the only about the only other thing I can tell you, you from reading, uh, other than reading his bio, is that he's a great colleague. He's a great partner, and he's someone I call a friend. So. Thank you. Let's take a start. Can I? So the first slide is registration. If anybody hasn't registered yet, or and is going to have employees, there's a very in BC. There's a very you have to register, uh, and it's you want to because it's 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 um, it makes your life easier. Anyway, there's a very good website there. Uh, it's a one-stop registration. So take a look at that, and if you if you uh, need to register, that's where you go. And you do get all these slides at the end, so just yeah. know that. Yeah, and I've put I've put reference materials all throughout. So. Yeah, I said to the last group, you know, if um, it's really important as a business, a lot of people I think in the room will agree your, your employees are your most significant asset. So it's really good uh, to have at least a basic level of familiarity with employment law. You're going to have lawyers and you're going to have human resource professionals, especially you might have them in-house if you're a bigger organization. But again, uh, to shoot ourselves in the foot here, anytime you call a lawyer, it's expensive. So if you can educate your, it's money well spent, but... Uh, <laughs> But if you can educate yourself uh, even a little bit, uh, then you can maximize the value you get from your lawyer. You can have your list of questions. You can know some basic things. So I, I think it's, I think it's vital for for um, any level of business to uh, to have some basic uh, understanding. So the and the big part of it um, uh, in BC and in Canada, but we'll focus on BC, is this the BC Employment Standards uh, Act. So I think that's on the next. Um, slide yeah so again if people know this the employment standards it this act sets out basic minimum requirements that all employers have to comply with and it covers the, the obvious things wages hours of work annual vacation things like that it's a mandatory it's mandatory you must comply with the with the requirements of the act you can provide greater benefits than the act uh, requires but you have to provide for the minimums so the act, you probably everybody is familiar with it. Uh, you can't contract out of it. So even if you're employed, you know, with the example I used last time was you don't want to pay overtime because it's obviously a huge cost. And your employees, but, and they're happy to work 12 hours a day at straight time. Again, that's a breach of the act. And it might be fine now. And the fact that your employee agrees to it uh, now, if a complaint comes afterwards, it's no answer. So you, you cannot contract out of the act. Uh, the act is complaint driven. I feel I, this point is kind of nasty. I mean, it is complaint driven, but you know, so you can have a great relationship with your employee who you're just paying straight time, but then something happens. That employee leaves you, goes to employment standards, and wants a whole bunch of money for, for overtime. That's a problem. Or you can get a complaint from a competitor. Um, I've had that happen. So the guy across the street's been kind of watching, is is growly about the com the, com the competitor, and they make a complaint to employment standards. Employment standards can come in and independently audit. You know, <laughs> when you engage a lawyer um, on any one of these things, whether we're talking IP here or um, around employee law, is that they're, what they're here for, what Mary Lee's here is for, is to give you, to really be clear about all your risks. The decision lies with you. So, you know, I, I really think it's unfair when people say, well, my lawyer told me to. Your lawyer gave you advice and you make the decision. So, like, that's like put on your big girl pants and make decisions. And she's going to tell you all of the, the risks for you. And then your, your things to go back and say, what is the risk? What does that mean? And then to balance it out for yourself. Overtime kicks in either after eight in a day or 40 in a week. So, you know, the, the term I use, and I hope it's not offensive, but the ESA is very paternalistic. It's like takes care of employees. And so just like the act speaks that you must force your employees to take vacation, even if they don't want to. Similarly, the branch will tell you it's your responsibility as an employer 
to make sure your employees aren't working overtime. How do you do that? I don't know, but you've got to have policies in place. You've got to have, so if a, com yeah. so if a complaint is made, then you can say, listen, here's my memo that I wrote to Mary Lee Davies on April 20th saying, you're there not to work overtime, you're to work blah, 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 and that's it. So again, I just talked about this, the employment standards that forces you to make your employees take vacation. And even if they say, listen, I don't, I don't want to take vacation. I'm so desperate for the money. I just want money to, so I can buy a, an apartment in Vancouver. Uh, you, might, you might take a business risk there, but it will be a breach of the act because you were required to uh, force employees to take their vacation. The requirements are for vacation under the act are not onerous. Uh, it's two weeks after 12 consecutive months and three after five years, and it tops out at three. Again, lots of employers do more, but that's all you have to do. And so I guess to the extent that you do want to, and you can bank vacation, all those, all those nuances are in there, but I guess to the extent that people don't want to take their extra vacation, if you're providing more than the statute allows, you're, you're comfortable to do that. Let them, if you want to, to, to pay out vacation. That's expensive, but, but you can do that as well. So there's the leaves of absence. There's a whole bunch. They range from a few days to multiple weeks. The, the multiple week ones are the maternity and parental leave ones. Um, the others are a few days. Um, th again, they're unpaid. Uh, they don't take the place of annual vacation, so you can't say, well, listen, you took a bereavement leave, a, a, a jury duty, and um, a reservist leave. I don't even know what reservist leave is. So you're not getting your vacation. Obviously, you know that. That doesn't work. Um, uh, again, obvious point, I guess, at the end is if somebody does take a statutory leave, um, the time that they're on that leave counts as for their any benefits that are tied to their length of service. They're still an employee. They're an employee on leave. So if they would kick up to the next uh, year's vacation entitlement, what, even though they've been off for a year, they get the next year's vacation entitlement. I, this is an issue that comes up a lot with the obvious one is uh, maternity and parental leave. So when somebody goes off for a, a sort of a practical issue that comes up is somebody goes off for a long leave, the replacement comes in, and they're just awesome, and they're so much better than the person who had the job in the first place. And I used to get a lot, not so much now, I used to get a lot of calls about this. Um, you have an obligation to return the employee to the job that he or she uh, had uh, or to a comparable job so um, again you're going to sort of you're going to have to think about that but if you've got somebody who's come in um, who's awesome and you want to keep them you can't just you can't just uh, terminate your employee and so even if you provide severance they have a basis under the act section 54 of the employment standards act to say no no no, no. I get my job back so um, so you have to watch for that so you have to but you have there's some flexibility there um, there's a comparable job so if you can give something that pays comparably and has terms and conditions that are comparable. There's lots of litigation over that, but then you're, then you're okay. So that's a bit for leaves. The next thing I was gonna talk about severance pay. Uh, that's a big thing for employers when you go to terminate someone. Uh, if you have just cause, we could spend days talking about just cause, but if you, if you have just cause, you can terminate someone summarily without notice or pay in lieu of notice. Uh, it's hard uh, to prove cause. Uh, uh, it used to be, I used to say, if you can prove an integrity offense, like someone lied or someone stole money or things like that, you had a, the perfect case I would say is 85% is because judges are human, but I would say you had a pretty much a perfect case. Supreme Court of Canada in the last few years has talked about, um, it's quite annoying, um, it talked about looking at the context of the misconduct. And so was the employee's dishonesty caused by something that makes it less, less significant? If someone has been misconducting themselves and like pretty serious stuff, or you've done the progressive discipline, listen, you sat me down and told me once, then I keep doing the wrong thing, sat me down again, wrote me up, things like that. Then you get to the end of your rope and you want to terminate me. But you don't want to, you don't want to get involved in law, lawyers or lawsuits, um, so you're going to pay me. Get a release for that because, um, because you don't have to pay me severance because I've misconducted myself, I've given just cause. Uh, but you're going to do it anyway, but get a release because otherwise if you don't and you only give me statutory minimums and you say, okay, you're fired, but here's your severance pay, I'm going to go get a lawyer and uh, say and write you and say I need way more severance than that. Employment standards isn't reasonable. And then you're going to say, listen, you're lucky you got anything. I fired you for cause. Well, you didn't. You gave me severance. There's nothing you didn't say. Okay, so today we're going to go through uh, um, this list of items. So first, uh, the IQ, IP vocabulary, just so we're talking about the same thing. A lot of people walk into my office and say, I want to patent my name, and we really are talking about different things here. So we're going to go through that and the kinds of rights there are and why you would uh, register them, the costs and benefits of doing so, uh, what's most applicable to you and valuable to your business, uh, some miscellaneous traps for the unwary. There's lots of little potholes in intellectual property law that can uh, screw up, and then five intellectual property takeaways. So here's the kinds of intellectual property, this slide. And so the left column is the kind of IP 
The, the next column is who owns it, uh, what, what it is or what it protects, and then in the how column, how do you get the rights and uh, how long do they last for. So a patent, um, we have a number of patents in the room, you, 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 the inventor owns that unless you have an agreement to the contrary that they've assigned it to the employer, so that's something to have in your employment agreements. Uh, you only get rights if you register it, uh, and you've got to do that on a country by country basis. Copyrights is the most common work product from an employee or a contractor. The, uh, the, in general, the author owns that. There's an, there is an exception for employees who do it in the ordinary course of business. And your copyright covers uh, any expression from uh, any logo, design, um, writing, technical writing, anything like that is co covered by copyright. And those rights arise automatically without registration, but there are benefits to registration. Uh, the trademark is the word, name, symbol, device you use to, to differentiate your products or services or yourself from those of others. Uh, those rights can arise automatically or through registration. They arise automatically in the place where you use the mark. If you've got a restaurant in Vancouver, you're known locally and you get rights, common law rights, just by existing and using your mark and providing services. But there's definite benefits to registration. You know, you get coverage across the country, not just where you have a local reputation. You can apply in other jurisdictions as well. So, uh, and then the, the uh, rights arise, uh, uh, the, the person entitled to a trademark is the person who has priority, which arise either from use or from application. So if you have a great idea for something, but you're not quite ready to use it, you can apply, and that sort of uh, locks you in for priority from the date of application. So industrial designs are the aesthetic aspects of functional articles. So uh, a sweatshirt with a design on it, that's an industrial design. The design of a dress, the, the, uh, I, the, whatever, um, whatever the aesthetic aspects are, and those are registrable and only enforceable if they're registered. And then there's copyright and trade secret. Um, those are uh, uh, last forever, but they're only protectable if you are protecting them, making efforts to keep the, them confidential. So there's other rights out there, but this is uh, the main categories to apply to a group like this. So this is about why register your intellectual property, some of the costs and benefits. So patents, uh, some of you know through personal pain cost many tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh, um, have to be done in each, roughly each country. Copyrights are very cheap to register. Uh, uh, there's no examination process. You can register themselves. And there are some benefits to registering a copyright. You can, uh, rights arise without registration, but if you want to recover damages, you have to register the copyright work. So uh, and maybe uh, it would be a, a good time to say if your business is relies heavily on the written word, if you've got course materials, policies, that sort of thing that you're sharing with others, copyright registrations are important in claiming copyright in your work product as well as the confidential information. Okay, so trademarks, um, the cost of registration can be, it's measured in the couple of thousand dollars on a per country basis. Uh, then there are, like I said, some benefits to registration in terms of priority, but also uh, enforceability. Uh, it, it's enforceable all across the country when you register it, not just where you have a local reputation. But enforcing it does cost money. <coughs> yes, for sure. Just remember that. The other thing is it's got a, 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 a salutary effect on people who are looking, thinking up names for their company if they go and look at the trademark registry and see your very similar name is already there. They're highly unlikely to pick that name. They'll, they'll look for something else. Okay, so what's the most applicable to and valuable to your businesses? So your business's most valuable assets other than your people are your intellectual property and your reputation and goodwill. So it's really important that you own your business's work product. That's the copyrights and inventions. Uh, your trademark represents your reputation and goodwill and what your customers use to identify you versus your competitors. And I always say when you go to sell your business, uh, a big chunk of what you're selling is the reputation and goodwill you've built uh, over years of working really hard in your business. And in the lo most modern businesses, the physical assets are a lot less relevant than the name and reputation in the long run. So something important to protect.
So miscellaneous traps for the unwary. Your business name registered in the company registry in Victoria does not protect your trademark. So it protects your business name from getting a similar business name registered in Victoria, but doesn't stop anyone from trading with a similar business name. So I could go register the name Coca-Cola Law in uh, Inc. in Victoria and no one could stop me. But uh, if I tried to do business under that name, I would be in for a whole world of pain and suffering. <laughs> so trademarks is how you protect those rights. <coughs> Failing to enforce your trademarks make them unenforceable over time. So if if a trademark points to the person who's providing the service or the goods, and if a second person uses it, and then a third, and then a fourth, then it doesn't point to anybody. So even if you have a registered trademark, if you don't police it and protect it, then it, it becomes generic. And so there's lots of famous <coughs> generic marks out there uh, in different countries, Escalator, Kleenex, Yellow Pages in the US are all marks that used to be trademarks, and now they are the descriptive name of the goods. So uh, another miscellaneous trap is spending money on registrations before you need to, or I also say, or waiting too long to spend it. So there's some of those rights we talked about arise without registration and just from use. And so if your business is local uh, um, you, and you've got copyrights, you don't need to register them. Uh, you don't need to register the trademark right away because you're getting a reputation. You have a common law right to enforce that trademark just by virtue of your reputation. Um, but as your business grows, as you start thinking about doing business in other jurisdictions, um, you need to be on that and getting the registration so you're not, you're not ha having your mark uh, diluted by the use of by others or being blocked from other jurisdictions because there's already somebody there who may have, may have seen your mark and, and copied it. Um, the next one is failing to own the work product of employees and contractors. So like I said, copyright, if you ask someone to do something in the course of their employment to write a manual, uh, the company owns the copyright in that manual. But if they invent something, you don't own their invention unless you have an assignment, a written assignment in your employment agreement. So I, it's good to get a written assignment for everything in, in the employment agreement. Likewise for contractors, we treat them similarly for a lot of things, but Contractors own all of their work product unless you have a written agreement to the contrary. So they also own their own copyright. And if that's the case, you can't enforce the copyright against others. They may be able to limit your use of it. Um, so these are, it's important to have this stuff in writing. So anti-spam legislation. This isn't exactly intellectual property, but uh, it's coming up hard, pretty fast on us here. So uh, as of July 1 of this year, there's going to be a, a right of action um, for anyone who's being spammed by any of your businesses. So the obvious thing is not sending a commercial electronic message without consent. And there's other requirements. You have that, that um, message has to contain, contain the sender information, has to have an unsubscribe mechanism. Uh, there's other ways to breach the act. Installing programs on people's uh, computers, mining email addresses or personal information. There's all kinds of things in this legislation. But the main one to be worried about for most of you probably is you have customer lists, people that are prospects. You're emailing them regularly. You're sending newsletters. You're sending them all kinds of stuff. And if you don't have their consent for that, you have a potential problem because the, the damages are up to $200 per message and a million dollars a day. And we're expecting class action lawsuits to start right after July the 1st. Also, uh, there's personal liability for directors and officers. I'll, I'll take questions in just a second. The one last thing is if, if you do do this, if you start spamming people, your defense is uh, due diligence. I did everything reasonable I could have to avoid spamming, but it happened, you know, and it can happen. So that means being careful about documenting the efforts you made to, make, to get the consents, to keep the purity of your lists and anything you're picking up from someone else, you've made efforts to do the right thing. Pick a distinctive mark. This is when you're, you're naming your company or your product. Pick a distinctive mark that points to you and you alone and is memorable. Search for infringement, uh, the use that's already out there. Uh, use your marks properly, i.e. use them the way you register them so that you've, you are protecting the registry mark and police them, make sure nobody else is using them. The next one is get invention assignments from employees and copyright and invention assignments from contractors, all in writing. Doesn't. A copyright, an interest in copyright isn't valid unless it's in writing. 
Uh, make sure you own your work product and then license. Don't assign it. Protect its confidentiality by agreement and marking on the, on the product. Consider the reach of your business over time. Most IP rights arise and are, are enforceable on a country by country basis. And finally, an IP lawyer or a patent agent will generally meet with you to discuss your idea or issue at least once without any charge or obligation. So James thinks he'd love to meet with you all. <laughs> Is that what you just said? I didn't. I, not exactly, I but it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so weird. Is that why you got Mary Lee? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's some trademarks that uh, that I've, I've registered. Nice. Well, you guys, Larkin, what do we have to do here? Wrap it up. We have to wrap Yay. It up. Yay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.